you're looking at images from the Parthenon frieze here. Now, the Parthenon frieze was 160 meters or 524 foot long. So we're not gonna be able to look at all of it together. So what I thought we'd do is I'd focus in on a few key sections, the most important ones and what they might show and how all of those different scenes fit together to give us an idea of what the theme of the entire piece might be. Now, I should also point out that unlike the frieze on the Siphonian treasury at Delphi, the frieze on the Parthenon is not actually on the outside of the temple. That's where the sculpted metopes are, but rather it's on the outer wall of the cellar. So you've got to, to look inside the set of columns and up above the porches. And remember, the cellar was the, the room at the centre of a temple that housed the, the cult statue that would be worshipped by the community. And in the case of the Parthenon as well, there was an inner room that was a treasury too. So the scene that we're looking at at the moment, this section of the frieze is, is on the east side and it's to do with the gods. And again, like in previous videos, we've got these images kind of sat one on top of another. Just try and consider them you know, from top to bottom as though you were reading them from left to right because that's going to be important in a moment for thinking about why the gods are positioned in the arrangement that they are. So let's go through who each god is first, and then we'll talk a bit more about that positioning and theory. So at the top, on the left-hand side, we've got Hermes, and you've got to have a look there for his batassos, his traveller's hat, which is on his knee. Next to him, with the arm raised in the air, no doubt holding a wine cup and turning back to have a really good chat, is Dionysus. To Dionysus's right, with the torch in her hand to look for her daughter Persephone in the underworld, is of course Demeter. And then we have got Ares, who is looking very relaxed and laid back there with his hands on his knees and his feet possibly leaning originally on his shield. In the image below, we've then got... Uh, looking at one another, the husband and wife, but also brother-sister pairing of Hera and Zeus. And we can tell it's Zeus, not only is, is he bearded, but he's sat on the most substantial chair. So his is always more like a throne. It's got an arm to it when others tend to be sat on stools, for example. And we know it's Hera, not only because she sat next to him, but look how she's turning to look at him and she's lifting her married woman's veil indicative of the relationship between the two and just behind them a smaller figure which is likely to be Iris who is the female messenger of the gods and Hermes counterpart. Then at the bottom we've got um, Athene and next to her with a crutch just slightly visible under his arm is Hephaestus and these two are connected because they're both gods of arts and crafts. Athene of weaving and Hephaestus of blacksmiths. And then we can see beneath, we have Poseidon, Apollo, very youthful, no beard, um, and his sister Artemis quite often has the cloth headdress over her there. Now, I should point out that the top two images and then the bottom two images are actually separated by... A, a main scene which we shall have a look at in a moment concerning um, humans and they're much smaller in proportion to the gods so they're not all in one um, continuous part of the frieze there is that initial separation and as I say we'll have a look at that main scene in a moment and think about what it shows but interestingly most of the gods have their backs to it anyway now, I said there was a theory around the positioning of the gods, and this comes from a scholar called David Stuttard, and I've mentioned him when I was talking about the positioning of gods in the east pediment of the Parthenon. And remember that the east pediment is directly above this section of the frieze. So if the theory works, we're seeing a mirroring uh, in those two pieces of sculpture, which would be really, really interesting. So David Stuttard's theory, again, is that gods on the left-hand side of both the pediment and now the frieze are those ones that are associated with the underworld. So Hermes, K, 
can travel between the upper world and the world below. He takes the souls of the dead down to Hades. Dionysus, early Dionysus, kind of Mycenaean, archaic Dionysus, very much about death and rebirth. Demeter, of course, associated with the Eleusinian mysteries and goes to look for her daughter who has been abducted by Hades. And Ares is going to have that natural association because as god of war, sending countless souls down to Hades frequently. Versus the gods on the other side, gods of the upper world, arts, crafts, for example, the sky. So again, he says, read it from left to right, and we're focusing on this idea of darkness to light and the idea of a rebirth, fitting again with Athene's birthday being um, possibly the subject matter of the entire freeze. We're going to have a look in a moment that it could be the Panathenaic procession. But also, um, the pediment above this section of the freeze is, of course, Athene's birthday, where she sprung from the head of Zeus. So let's have a look at this scene that is separating the two groups of gods. And that's the scene at the top here. Now, what we can see is that there is a large piece of cloth that's being folded up by a man and a kind of a, and a youth. Now, that is often considered to be the new Peplos, that the little wooden statue of Athene that was housed in the Eric Theon got as part of the Panathenaic procession. This was kind of like a gift for Athene's birthday. And um, just an interesting little fact about that wooden statue, the Athenians believed it had fallen out of the sky. So it had not been made by human hands and therefore was even more precious. Now, what would have helped us identify whether that was the peplos that was being given to the statue of Athene is the original paintwork. Now, the Parthenon would have been originally very brightly coloured. It had a blue background. But we know that the peplos contained a gigantomic scene on it. So if that was there when it was originally painted, it must have been very obvious to the ancient Greeks what this particular scene was. The only issue that we have with that is that I've put again the image of Athene and Hephaestus at the bottom, is that Athene has her back to that scene. So if that is the, the chief priest, the Archon Basileus, and the priestess of Athene Pelias behind him, handing this peplos, then why isn't she more interested in that scene? You know, it's honouring her, it's all about her. And that's led some other scholars to have an alternate to theory about this particular scene. And they say that instead of being the peplos, that piece of material is a burial shroud. And we're actually seeing the sacrifice of King Eric Theus's daughter. Again, there are issues with this too. Uh, the Greeks don't really go in for human sacrifice. Even in mythology, there's only a handful of cases, you know, Polyxena, um, Iphigenia, so that doesn't quite fit. And also with the overall impression of the entire frieze, which seems to be a procession and seems to show various groups of people carrying ritual objects and animals towards sacrifice that would be needed in the Panathenaic procession, the celebration of Athene's birthday. So it's worth being aware of these two different theories, the new peplos, the possible burial shroud for King Eric Theus's daughter, but that there are also kind of problems with each. So if Athene has her back to that main scene, what is she looking at? Well, actually, she's facing the cavalrymen that you can see at the top of my screen here. Now, if you actually go and count them up, there are 192 of them. You've got to discount the ones that are in chariots, though. And the scholar John Boardman, therefore, has a theory that they may represent the dead from the Battle of Marathon. So the heroes, they were worshipped in Athens as heroes afterwards, and they're known in Greek as the Marathonomachoi. And if we actually have a look at them in their appearance, they are typically heroic. Um, many of them are nude, fully or partially, which would be very in keeping with this idea of them as heroes, because, of course, typically people don't go into battle or ride horses in the nude. 
They're also, though, very idealistic in how they look, um, not just in appearance, but actually in behavior as well. So for a start, all of them are fully in control of their horses, even when they are starting to, to gallop. They are the ones that are firmly in control. They also have um, facial features that are incredibly like uh, the Dorifros by Polyclitus. So we get that impression that they are meant to be idealistic males and therefore it makes that theory that they are the Marathonomacoi very attractive. Um, two other scenes that are just of interest as well and support the theory that what we are looking at is the Panathenaic procession overall and a celebration of Athene's birthday by the polis or city-state of Athens, are these two. In the middle scene there, we have got women carrying ritual objects needed for the celebration. And at the bottom, we've got one of the animals that is being led to sacrifice up onto the Athenian Acropolis. So how do we put all of this together? The gods present, the fact that we've got idealised heroes from the Battle of Marathon, and also the fact that we've got everyday scenes of animal sacrifice and, and ritual. Well, it's most likely that what we are looking at is therefore a idealised version of the Panathenaic festival, especially since the cavalry men didn't traditionally take part. Um, and that is how I think you should, you should put forward your theories. And um, it also helps explain some of the issues with that main scene as well, that, that this is idealistic and not always realistic.